Mm -hmm. that Tosh is here the whole time there, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, is that on? Can you hear me? They'll switch it on when, uh, oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're ready? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, we'll continue uh, the session with uh, Ling Lin, uh, and, um, well, please, the title you can read. Okay, yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the organizers to uh, putting together this conference after this long period of abstinence. And also um, for giving me the opportunity to present some work I've been doing in collaboration with uh, Jonathan Heckman, uh, Craig Laurie, Hao Zhang, and uh, Gianluca Toccarato. And it also is based in part on an older paper by, uh, with Fabio and Marcus from about one and a half a year ago. Okay, so, um, so the main topic, the main player of this talk will be six dimensional superconformal field theories. Uh, and I will focus mostly on 1,0. And uh, we've already heard this morning um, about various aspects of these uh, in terms of our, uh, to, to increase our knowledge about non-perturbative non dynamics and strongly coupled quantum field theories. And uh, of course, uh, one key property, as also mentioned this morning already, is uh, the global symmetries, in particular, not only the algebra structure, but really the group structure. And um, you might wonder, okay, uh, is it just some property that you can enumerate and, and, and stick it to your favorite SCFT as a tag? But um, there's also more uh, application-oriented uh, use of that information, uh, namely when you consider compactifications of these theories to lower dimensions, then the difference in the, what, you, what Jonathan called naive group structure versus the actual group structure actually comes in uh, to be quite important. So for the talk today, I will focus first on the global structure of the non-abelian part of the flavor symmetry. And this is, as I mentioned earlier, goes back to some work with Fabio and uh, Marcus. And um, uh, with these, uh, oh, oops, <laughs> something popped up. Uh, yeah, with these, uh, uh, um, uh, yeah, the, this bottom-up approach to determine the flavor symmetry group, uh, we can then apply it to the so-called Steve, Steve Whitney compactifications, that is basically torus compactifications of these 60 FTs with some toft fluxes. Uh, but then as also Jonathan highlighted already, and I'll try to um, uh, emphasize during the third part of the talk, is how also abelian factors, and in particular the R symmetry of 60 SCFTs, can have a non-trivial mixing in terms of a global structure. Okay, so um, even though I, you know, F theory has been uh, instrumental in our understanding of 60 SCFTs, uh, I will not talk much about the geometric construction of these theories. Instead, what will be relevant to me is just that these, uh, these SCFTs have a tensor branch, so there's some deformation you can do that breaks the um, conformal symmetry, and uh, the tensor branch gauge theory has a sort of some quiver where you have certain uh, gauge factors attached to, uh, associated with tensor multiplets. And the quiver-like structure of, these, um, of, this, of this depiction uh, tells you information about the pairing between the tensors, which in turn is related to the geometric, geometric realization of uh, SCFTs and F-theory, which again, I will not mention will not be important for my talk. And one particular um, constraining fact about SCFTs in six dimensions, or actually gauge, chiral gauge theories in six dimensions, is that uh, already gauge anomalies are quite uh, restrictive. And in, in almost all of these theories, just writing down the pairing matrix and the uh, gauge factors limit, fixes uniquely what kind of hypermultiplets you can have in your theory. So this, such SCFTs, roughly speaking, have uh, uh, two parts in their global symmetry. One is, of course, the superconformal algebra, and the other part is the flavor symmetry. Um, and 
on the tensor branch, the flavor symmetry uh, can be made manifest in terms of the symmetry that rotates the hypermultiplets you have in turn uh, that are charged under your gauge factors. And because you have broken the conformal symmetry, uh, you don't have access to the full superconformal algebra, but still the subpart that is formed by the R symmetry and of course the Lorentz uh, uh, transformations are manifest in the field theory description. I should say the R symmetry is uh, in geometric uh, constructions not always manifest, especially in F theory that's, it's hard to see, well it's impossible to make explicit in geometry, but in the M theory side sometimes you can uh, realize that in terms of some rotation in the transverse space to some M5 frames. Um, and here I've only talked about the algebra, but as we've heard this morning, uh, the, the group structure can be different from the naive one in that there is a subgroup of the center, which I don't know if see, that acts trivially on, the, uh, on all the local operators. And so you would expect that the um, global group is quotiented by this subgroup. And for most of the talk, I will focus on, on really the, the global, par, uh, global symmetry that acts on Lorentz scalar, so those that are singlets under the uh, Lorentz group. But it's important to keep in mind, as well, I will explain later, that there really is this uh, Lorentz part sticking around. And just uh, as a general comment, this subgroup C here is a discrete finite abelian group, so it decomposes into a product of uh, finite factors, and you don't need, really need to care about these uh, indices here. All I'm trying to highlight here is that it generally can be split into three parts. The first part sort of embeds only into the non-abelian part of the flavor group. Then there's a second part that embeds also non-trivially into the abelian factor and the non-abelian uh, non flavor part. And finally, there will be a single discrete quotient that may also embed into the R symmetry. And um, so I will go through step by step into these. Yes, Sakura. Can you also have something like one-form symmetries? Yes, in general, you will also have one-form symmetries. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah sorry. So, so uh, uh, I should have been more precise in saying that here I'm only considering a zero-form global symmetry. And and for the examples I talk about, there will be no one-form symmetry. So no two group structures arising. But in principle, there can be in 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 other examples like the ones you've looked at this morning. Okay, so, and I will focus on a bottom-up approach based on just the tensor branch gauge description. So it will not make explicit reference to any geometric or stringy constructions. Yeah, so sorry that I may not be very suited to this, to the topic of this conference. But anyhow, so how do we characterize the global group? Uh, so we've heard this morning about how they act on uh, local and extended operators, but from a very bottom-up view theory perspective, difference in the global structure of your symmetry group, whether it's gauge or flavor, uh, manifests itself in the way you can write down a principal bundle that is valued either in G or G mod C. And the difference between these two is typically, as measured by some cohomology, which is typically referred to as the Steve Whitney class, W, and in the language of higher form generalized symmetries, you can really think of this uh, Steve Whitney class as the background field for your center flavor symmetry. And um, one effect that uh, turning on such a, the background for such a uh, center symmetry is that your churn classes associated to these principal bundles now fa uh, become fractional. So, so for each type of algebra, the, there is a coefficient alpha here that is specific to the algebra. The values I will show, some of it I will show later. But the whole point is that because these things are, uh, these things are fractional, in general, you get a fractional cohomology class for your second churn class. And uh, on the tensor branch of 60 SCFTs, these second churn classes enter the game through the topological couplings generated by the Green-Schwartz mechanism that is needed to cancel your gauge anomalies. So these coefficients here, well, this is the tensor coupling uh, we've heard earlier, and the coefficients B that couple to the flavor, non-abelian flavor symmetries, are determined essentially just by anomaly cancellation of uh, local gauge anomalies. And in an F3 setting, you can really think of these as some intersection number between compact curves that support the gauge symmetry and some non-compact curve that support the 
flavor symmetry. Although, again, you don't really need this geometric picture, and indeed, this procedure also applies to cases where the flavor symmetry is not manifestly in geometry. And the idea now of having such a fractional piece inside your green schwartz coupling is that it allows you to quantify whenever, whenever you cannot turn on such a corresponding twist, namely whenever the fractional pieces in the second turn classes add up in such a way that the whole four form, the, the so-called instanton density is fractional, then what you find is that uh, the theory is not invariant and the large gate transformations of the tensor, of the, of the, of the um, two form fields inside the tensor multiplets that in 60 coupled to the uh, uh, instanton densities. And this story is actually parallel to what people have studied before in 40 theories, where now instead of the two form tensor field, it's just the theta angle of your gauge theory. And in, th in these papers, this kind of fractional, uh, this obstruction to turning on such a twisted gauge bundle, uh, it's what people call anomaly in the space of couplings. But in this case, in 60, it's not really a total anomaly, it's really an obstruction. It's just, just saying that whenever this cohomology class is fractional, you cannot, you, there's something wrong with your theory. So you have to basically make sure that the twist you turn on have to keep that class integer. And I should also uh, mention uh, that you can apply the same logic to now gravity theories, where everything has to be the gauge or broken. And as Miriam, I think, will talk about on, her th uh, on Thursday, if I remember correctly. Oh, Wednesday, sorry, yeah. Uh, this will also come in handy when you talk about supergravity theories where you want to constrain the global form of the gauge group. Okay. So let me just walk th through uh, this logic through in an example. So the simple example I have written down here is uh, an, uh, this SCFT that you get by putting a stack of M5 brains, uh, probing a, uh, a C2 mod gamma SUN um, uh, singularity. And so in terms of F theory, it's just a uh, collection of minus two curves and intersect in the linear quiver, and every one of them has been decorated with an SUN gauge factor. And if you walk, work out the Green Schwartz mechanism in this case, including the flavor symmetry factors, you find that the four form coupling to, uh, coupling to, the, uh, two, uh, to, uh, to the tensor multiplets takes the schematic form where um, the gauge factor on that node comes in with the coefficient plus two, and the guys left and right come with the coefficient minus one. And I have included here the possibility that these i's um, can run on the, on, on the flavor factors. Okay, so for SUN, the, if you turn on a general background for its um, center twisted, uh, um, as, yeah, for, it, for the center symmetry, then the second turn class fa fractionalizes with this particular um, rational number. And you see, of course, if I in general put in turn on a general background field labeled by different WIs for each different gauge factor, this thing will be not allowed because the net result will be a fractional class. But if you correlate these background fields amongst them, in particular if you choose them all to be equal, then as you can see here straight away, these different fraction parts just cancel out. So what it means is that you can turn on now a background field for the diagonal Zn, the diagonal of all of the Zn's in, 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 in this linear quiver. And so you end up with a gauge group that would be, of, or a gauge times flavor group, which would be of the form Sun to the power of, let's say, this thing here has m factors modded out by Zn. And in if you just restrict yourself to the gauge invariant operators, then that tells you that the non-abelian flavor symmetry is SUN times SUN mod ZN. Okay, so, so in other words, this analysis of the churn classes tells you that it is consistent, at least from a bottom-up perspective, to turn on a twist, but only at maximum a single ZN twist in the diagonal. And this example is particularly simple in the sense that this result would also be predicted if you look at the hypermultiplet. But actually, there are more um, complicated examples 
um, for example, here, where you have a minus one curve in F-theory language with an SP, um, which has an SO flavor factor. That, in turn, has some more complicated center. It's a product. Um, and in this case, I mean, I don't want to walk through the detail. What you find is that uh, you can only turn on the Z2 subgroup that correlates the Z2 of the gauge factor with one of the Z2 factors of the spin center. So that the flavor symmetry, in the end, if you consider, again, only gauge invariant object, is spin four mod Z2, but it's not the vector Z2. And this sort of emphasizes the non-perturbative aspect of this description. Namely, if you looked at the hypermultiplets, which is a vector representation under the SO, you would have expected that you can also turn on the diagonal inside the uh, spin flavor symmetry because that leaves the vector representation invariant. But actually, if you, uh, for example, follow Sakura's work, then you can show explicitly from uh, uh, geometric constructions that there are certain stringy states that breaks this diagonal Z2. And this is indeed captured again also by the fractionality of this incident density. Okay, so um, the, this is these are some simple examples, but one can directly apply this to more complicated, more elaborate examples. For example, uh, if you look at a large class of so-called Orbi instantons, these come from uh, a stack of M5 brains now probing some singularity that is wrapped by M9 brains, then you have an EA times G flavor symmetry, where G is the type of the singularity that you wrap. And you can further generate uh, another class of this type of theory by considering some uh, Higgs branch deformations. And these Higgs branch deformations are known to be characterized by some homomorphism from, uh, from this finite ADE group into E8. And um, it goes back to some work by a mathematician Katz that tells you, in fact, such a homomorphism is in one to one correspondence to a tuple of numbers, integers associated to the extended weight, uh, extended Dinkin diagram of the eight. And what we find is that if you start from such an Orbi incident theory and perform such an Higgs branch deformation, there's only f a few examples that have a non trivial center flavor symmetry. But uh, there's some numerology that goes in here. I don't I think I have time to discuss it, but basically this gives you a, from, from this simple uh, algorithmic procedure a large class of examples that have non-trivial Z2 all the way up to Z6 uh, center flavor symmetry in the non-abelian part of the flavor symmetry. Okay, so now I've produced for you an, essentially an infinite class of theories that have these kind of uh, quotients in their uh, non-abelian flavor symmetry, so you might wonder, okay, what do I do with this information? And in fact, one direct application of this result is that you can consider now compactifications of these series on a T2 down to 4D, where they give you new classes of n equals two superconformal field theories. And the basic idea goes back to Witten in 97, where he said that whenever you have a group, flavor or gauge group of the type uh, that is non simply connected, then you can turn on a pair of holonomies on the two one cycles of the torus that do not commute in the non uh, non uh, sorry that do not do commute in the quotient but not in the naive gauge group and uh, this pair of holonomies essentially is related to the Steve Whitney class of this uh, uh, twisted bundle you've turned on on the torus and if you do that then there's some result uh, by by these gentlemen that tell exactly how you construct and how you compute data like central charges and Coulomb branch operator dimensions from the six dimensional theory. And this now you can apply straight away to this huge class of examples and find many new theories. So here I have one particular example where I just take the uh, E8, uh, the E8 SUN orbit instanton theory where I've activated a Z6 homomorphism. So all I wanted to show is that in six dimensions you have a SU6P flavor symmetry and some SU6 and SU3 times SU2. And by the mechanism of this center twist, you break these flavor symmetries down in 6 to 4D such that you are left with only the SUP part. 
and again, from this uh, general uh, from the algorithms, you can directly compute the central charges of this field theory uh, for arbitrary values of n and p. And for p equals one, there has been some recent uh, um, alternative constructions uh, in the in the in, in the literature. And in fact, this construction of four-dimensional n equals two theories is a very active field of research that goes back all the way to the 90s, and there are various different types of approaches. Um, from the top down, you, you uh, essentially starting from various stringy or six-dimensional examples. Uh, but also there are a more recent uh, approach from a bottom-up where you really constrain what possible dynamics you can have on the Coulomb branches of n equals two 40 SCFTs. And there has been a, um, a fairly comprehensive catalog of theories in the recent, uh, from last year, about all the rank one and rank two uh, 40 theories you can have, or oh, sorry, that people have constructed or know how to construct. And it turns out that almost all of these theories can be constructed from six dimensions using this Stephen Whitney twist. So here's just uh, the table that um, appears in this paper, and except for four cases here, we are able to construct all of them through this kind of Stephen Whitney twisted compactification, and also reproduce, of course, the central charges and the Coulomb branch dimensions. Um, and it would be interesting to sort of try and pin that point how to get these things, which in particular also depends on exactly how this kind of S, uh, Stephen Whitney compactifications is related to other types of construction sets such as S-fold that Sakura has uh, and, and collaborators have uh, pioneered in recent years. Um, yeah, but so, so this is just a side comment that um, I have no, not much more to say than, uh, than also what has been observed in these papers. Okay, but let me now go back to 60 again and, and complete the characterization of the global group structure of the symmetries, including the remaining factors of your uh, symmetry algebra. And one part are the abelian, or I should say U1s really, so not uh, continuous abelian factors. And on the tensor branch, these abelian factors um, are in general not geometric, so, so you cannot make them ge the, f the, the, the U1 factor of the SCFT, you cannot generally make manifest in geometry. Um, and there are some ABJ anomalies that you have to carefully solve to make sure that they are really uh, an unbroken uh, at the quantum level. Um, sometimes there are, sorry, I, I, should, I should make that comment later. Anyhow, so like, just like the um, non-abelian flavor symmetries, there's also a Green-Schwartz mechanism that you can introduce for the abelian part that cancels this type of anomaly. And they will formally just introduce this type of term inside your Green-Schwartz 4 form. And I've introduced this coefficient one half here for convenience because one half times these coefficients, sorry, factoring out the factor one half, these coefficients C are if you can realize this U1 factor geometrically, such as considered by works of Timo et al., then these correspond to the well-known height pairings of Shioda maps in, in, in F theory. But that's just a side comment here. In any case, you can explicitly determine these coefficients by the usual anomaly cancellation procedure. And in particular, say here, if you only consider one loop contributions from hypermultiplets, then these coefficients uh, are linear in the two charges associated with the two uh, U1s that you pick. And in particular, this means that if you consider really the combination of the coefficient multiplied with the first turn classes, then the full uh, four form I4 is in, uh, insensitive if you rescale the U1 charge. And this is of course important because uh, because the, the fractionality can change when you multiply things by some integers, and so, so this whole argument about uh, the, uh, something being integral or not integral depends crucially whether or not some rescaling messes up the, your, 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 uh, your results. But it, in any case, uh, the, now the same logic applies as before. If I have some abelian flavor factors whose uh, first turn classes enter the uh, anomaly cancellation, then that will tell me what type of fractional non-abelian bundles I can turn on, such that the fractional part is canceled by the fractional first turn classes of your abelian backgrounds. 
Okay, so, so um, just to give you a simple example, a, a feeling for how I determine this kind of fractional shift, let's look at a simple example of a UN gauge bundle. A UN, of course, is equivalent to SUN times U1 modded out by a common ZN subgroup. And for UN, the representations are essentially all SUN representations where the U1 charge is equal to the n -ality. So if you write your SUN representation in terms of Young tableaus, then the U1 charge in the normalization where all charges are integer, uh, the U1 charge is just equal to the number of boxes mod n. And then you can simply work out that in this normalization, the trivially acting element corresponding to the Zn quotient is this element inside the center of SUN times U1. Okay, and in terms of the bundles, um, the, uh, the, the, the first strand class now of this U1 mod Zn, which is just another U1 bundle, now has the same fractional, sorry, has now a fractional piece that is proportional to the Stephen Whitney class of the SUN mod Zn bundle. So in some sense, what you're describing here for the UN bundle is in terms of a pair of SUN mod Zn and a U1 bundle where the fractional parts are correlated precisely by this factor here. So more generally, if you have a, some non-abelian par times a U1 and there's a Zn quotient, then you can determine this kind of fractional shift of the first trend class by writing down what is the trivially acting group. But this has to be done in the normalization where the U1 charges spans the whole integer numbers. And then the fractional part, a uh, fraction number in the exponent is exactly the fractional part in the first trend class. Okay, let's look at another simple example. This is the one that we've looked at earlier with the M5 probing a SUN uh, uh, singularity. So this thing has one uh, U, uh, U1 flavor symmetry that is free of ABJ anomalies. So that's a single U1 that is preserved at the quantum level. And under this U1, all the bifundamentals have charge one. And then you follow through the computation of the anomaly cancellation and determine that this coefficient is just 2n for every single tensor. So if you think about it geometrically, it would sort of mean that there is some height pairing divisor that intersects every single of these uh, uh, compact curves. So now there is a chain between each of these nodes, there is a bifundamental, or I should rather say fundamental anti-fundamental. And uh, for this set of uh, bifundamentals, uh, uh, hypermultiplets, you can work out the trivially acting element inside the center. This is sort of like a, a one over n in the U1 and uh, a, a, a ram that goes up along this chain here. Um, so this means that the first turn class of the U1 is just one over n times the background field associated to this complicated looking um, uh, center subgroup. But all in all, what you find is that when you plug in now the, the formula into the second and first turn class into the, into the, into the Green-Schwartz coupling, then all these fractional parts cancel precisely. So what you end up with is the statement that this M5 probing, a stack of M5s probing some ADE singularity, or SUN singularity, I should say, has a flavor symmetry group, the non-abelian part we've already looked at earlier, but now including the U1, there is a further ZN quotient. And in fact, you can rewrite this as the S of UN times UN I think I forgot a mod Zn here, sorry. And this again uh, is well known in, uh, in, in M-theory constructions, how you can rederive this result. Okay, so let me finally come to the thing that um, uh, Jonathan has uh, mentioned earlier, namely how the global structure can further be enriched if you include the R symmetry. So there are some non-trivial examples, ex particularly in four-dimensional superconformal field theories, where there's evidence that there's some non-trivial mixings going on between the R symmetry part and the flavor symmetry part. And um, 
one has to be a bit careful about this because if you just look at the scalar sector of your fear theory, then you might not be aware of the fact that, of course, um, there's also some spinorial objects in your theory, for example, the supercharges. And in order for the supercharges to be invariant under a center twist that twists the SU2, this must be accompanied also by a center twist of your uh, space-time Lorentz group. Okay. So luckily in six dimensions again, the Green-Schwartz coupling is sensitive to both such twists. Namely, there is a R symmetry bundle entering your uh, uh, Green-Schwartz vorform and the Pontryagin class of the tangent bundle. Okay. And in order to quantify these fractional shifts that you get after the twist, uh, it's useful to work in Euclidean signature where the first Pontryagin class of the tangent bundle is just a trace in the vector representation of uh, a spin six um, uh, principal bundle, and a spin six is SU2, so uh, SU4, sorry. Uh, so you can relate the first Pontryagin class to a fictitious uh, spin six or SU4 principal bundle whose second churn class fractionalizes like this. And I've already uh, did, did used the same variable to denote the fact that uh, the SU2R has to be correlated with that um, space-time Lorentz twist. So the background fields for their center twist, the W, are the same. Okay. So let's see another example. Here is a simpler version of the M5 probing, uh, probing some singularity. In this case, it's just a single M5. And the flavor symmetry is now enhanced to SU2N rather than two SUN factors on the left and right. And now, um, because it's a minus two curve or a tensor with self pairing two, the, sec uh, the Pontryagin class of the space time uh, tangent bundle actually doesn't enter the game. So the, um, the Green Schwartz four form only sees the R symmetry bundle. And for a general background choice, of all the three different centers, namely the center of SU engage, the center of SU2 and flavor, and the center of SU2R, you have some, diff some independent backgrounds for these uh, twists. And in order to obtain a integer four form, there needs to be some correlation. And this correlation takes a form that basically you correlate the flavor symmetry with both the gauge twist and the R symmetry twist. And what you end up with now is a global symmetry group, at least uh, the, acting on the bosonic part, uh, sorry, on the, on the scalar part of your uh, spectrum that depends on the parity of N. But in any case, there is some, always some non-trivial quotient acting on the SU2R symmetry. And also the other example that we looked at earlier with the, um, uh, with the SO4N flavor algebra. In this case, it works out a little bit more complicated, but at the end of the day, you also see that if you include the SU2R symmetry, there's a further twist inside the bundles that you're allowed to do. And again, there are some parity dependent, um, uh, uh, parity dependent result. And surprisingly, or not surprisingly, maybe depending on how you wanna look at this, this agrees perfectly with what other people have done in terms of a Higgs branch analysis, where I've looked at now on the Higgs branch uh, in Cairo ring, the generators of these, they carry some representations under the flavor symmetry and the uh, uh, um, R symmetry U1 part that you have broken on the Higgs branch. And this type of parity dependent result is precisely reproduced from that analysis. And I should say in this analysis, in these papers, they don't phrase it in terms of some global symmetry structure like that. They only say that they have these operators and they have these representations. But the point is that um, these, the result that they have on this spectrum is precisely, um, it, it, it is such that it allows for such a twist that's written down here, including the parity dependent twisting. Okay. So um, this brings me to the end of my talk. So I have told you uh, a way from the bottom up based just on the Green-Schwartz couplings of your, um, in, uh, on the tensor branch of 60 SCFTs, how you can determine or at least find a consistent condition, consistency condition for turning on 
um, a non-trivial twist of your gauge and global symmetries. And in particular, it includes the abelian and R symmetries, which was uh, previously not considered. And we've mainly looked at the applications to compactification on a torus for the non-abelian part of the flavor symmetry, because that already gives a huge class of new, well, not new, but a huge class of n equals two SCFDs for which we can compute the um, central charges and Coulomb branch operator dimensions. And of course, then it would be interesting to see if you can also, what, what happens if you now include these twisted compactifications with these new allowed twists that you have. Um, and also, if you just think of in terms of generalizing the geometry part of this problem, if you now not just do tori compactification, but also general Riemann surface compactifications, which then possibly gives you a new class of n equals one SCFTs from this perspective. And the other aspect uh, relates more to uh, talks of Sakura and Jonathan this morning, namely how, how, how this information features in the structure of higher symmetries. Um, so I think, um, Mr. Correct can correct me, but I think for the abelian part, the U1s never really feature into some higher group structures, but the non-abelian SU2 R symmetry might give rise to something new, interesting structures here. So um, yeah, that would be certainly worth exploring in the future. All right, with that, um, I'm done, thank you. <laughs> Come on. So, um, to my understanding on these Higgs branches, what they do is they construct a chiral ring and they write down essentially the representations of the chiral ring operators under your various global symmetries. So, the twist that I'm considering must leave all these objects invariant. Right? That, that is a necessary condition. And that's basically what we check. So they do not make a statement explicitly saying this is, has to be, because in principle, right, there could be other states that they're not capturing through the chiral ring computation that might transform differently under the global symmetries. And I think, yes, exactly. Yes. Okay, in the back there. Um, that's a good question. So, you I mean, repeat the, the question. Yeah, the question was if the, so uh, yeah, if, if the flavor symmetry, if I remember correctly, is always path connected. So even though not simply connected, at least path connected. Um, I don't think there is a general rule for that. In fact, I mean, Sakura has examples with outer automorphism to it, right, as part of the zero form symmetry. So, so these could. I guess form some semi-direct products with your non-abelian factors so that the total part is not connected. Could be. Okay, I did see somewhere else. Yes, please. Yes, so, um, we, I didn't mention it here, but also in the paper, we, or in the upcoming paper, we have a full appendix on this where you not only turn on the homomorphism that break D8, but also new potent orbits that break the other part of the flavor symmetry. And it agrees beautifully with other 40 results where a similar way of deforming and, and getting new classes of 40 theories uh, have been studied. So, so if you want details, I can show you the draft. All right, uh, Sakura. No, no, so, so, so far, the, all the examples, well, okay, I, um, since, since, I mean, we have this infinite class, right, of, of, of 60 theories that you can compactify. Um, I think there are examples, sorry. Let me go to this huge table here. Um, so you can see here that there are these um, labels P, U, blah, blah, blah. Probably you cannot see it. <laughs> I'm sorry. So there are a bunch of discrete parameters in all these classes. Oh, right, I can zoom in, yes, 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 yes. So, so the, so the, um, the sketch labels um, have, have you know, some discrete parameters, and in the 60 theory, for example, you can see that these correspond to some length of different ramps of your uh, quiver. And as far as I know, I think 
um, there's not a result for general values of these PQs for, say, the central charges, et cetera, um, in the literature. But I think rough, um, yeah, I have to dig, I have to look at the draft again where we just explain this. But there is some identification with known class S and S fold constructions, but uh, there are for um, specific values, say, of P, S, and Q, or only a subset of those turned on. So in principle here, there are, yeah, more parameters you can, you can move around. All right, I see no further uh, questions or comments, so then uh, we thank the speaker again. And we have again a break and then starts the gong show. All right. Thanks. Four.